Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the travel arrangements regarding a trip from London to Paris. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Welcome to Rocky's Travel Agency. My name is Robert. Can I help you? Yes, please. My name is Angela. I'm travelling to London in a couple of weeks and I will have to go to Paris before returning home to Toronto, Canada. My firm has booked my ticket out to London and back from Paris, but they have let me choose how I wish to travel to Paris. Wow, you're lucky. I've never been to Paris, though I see enough pictures of the place working here. So, what are my options? There are three main ones. You can take the train, fly or take a ferry. For the ferry, you will also need to take a train or bus or drive yourself. What would you recommend? Well, it depends on what you want. For convenience, the train is excellent. It leaves from the centre of London. From Waterloo Station? It used to go from there. Now it leaves from St Pancras Station, which is next to King's Cross Station. This will then take you under the sea in the Channel Tunnel, directly to the Gare du Nord in the centre of Paris in three hours. Wow, that is convenient. Then there is travelling by plane. You can fly to Paris from different London airports such as Heathrow, Gatwick, City, Luton and Stansted, as well as other airports around the country. The actual travel time is quite short, about 40 minutes only, but you'll need to get outside London to the airports, check in and wait, and then transfer into Paris when you arrive at the airport there. That can take an extra two hours in London and one and a half hours in Paris. OK. And what about the other option? There is a variety of ports from which you can get a ferry to France, though the fastest journey is from Dover to Calais, which is about an hour. You will need to take a train or bus to the port first, and the same when you arrive in France to get to Paris. Alternatively, you can hire a car and drive yourself. Uh, that too seems much longer. Well, for sure. The advantage for a visitor like you, though, is that you can get to see the English and French countryside and other towns much more closely. You don't even have to do it in one journey, but you can stay somewhere and explore, either in England or in France. What are the costs involved? The train directly to Paris is £50, which is about 80 Canadian dollars. The plane will cost about £60 if we book now, which is about 90 Canadian dollars. The ferry is about £30, which is about 45 Canadian dollars, but of course you will need to get to the British ferry port from London and to Paris from the French ferry port. How would I do that? You can get a bus to Dover from Central Bus Station in London, which is the nearest ferry port to France. You can get a train from Charing Cross Station in London to Dover as well. From Calais to Paris, I would recommend getting the train from the station in Calais. Hmm, that sounds a bit complicated. The thing is that I have not been to Paris before, so I think the best thing would be to get to Paris as quickly and easily as possible. So, that would be the direct train then? Yes, I think so. The price seems very good value as well. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. So, let me take some details from you so that we can buy your train ticket. First of all, what's your full name? Angela Bradbury. Could you spell Bradbury for me? B-R-A-D-B-U-R-Y. And your address? 
23 Brown Street, Toronto. And the postal code? M4C3DD. Oh, sorry, I mean TT. That's M4C3TT. Could I take a contact telephone number, please? Home or cell? I think cell is usually better. The cell is 07523-937-616. Fine. And on what date and at what time do you wish to travel? I'll be in London from the 11th of April for five nights, and then I can go to Paris. Will that be the 16th or the 17th? Uh, the 16th. That's right. And I'd like to go in the early afternoon so I won't be rushed. Around two o'clock would be good. There's a train at 2.20 that afternoon. Oh, that will be perfect. I guess you don't want a return ticket as you're already booked to Canada from Paris to Toronto. That's right. What is the arrival time of that train? Let's see. It departs at 2.20 and arrives in Paris at 5.20. Okay, that's fine. I didn't ask this before, but of course you can travel first or economy class. What would you like? What's the difference? The economy is £50, and for that you get a reserved seat from London to Paris. If you book first class, then you get a bigger seat. Lunch with drinks is served at your seat, and everything looks a bit nicer. That comes in at £108. It's quite a bit more, but you do get the special treatment. Mm, I'm not that worried about lunch. If we leave at 2.20, then I would have eaten already, and I want to be hungry for a great first French meal in Paris, so I'll go economy. So, the exact cost in Canadian dollars is $81.35. How would you like to pay? With this MasterCard, please. Could you read me the number, please? 8362-6028-6481-4724. Thank you very much. So, here is your reservation sheet and economy ticket confirmation. You will see that you are on train number EU621, and you have seat 30C. To remind you, it departs at 2.20 and arrives in Paris at 5.20. Can you read through and check the details for me, please? Let's see. That's all fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome, madam. Have a wonderful time in Paris. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear a man giving an introductory talk to parents at a youth centre. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the introductory talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to the Westley Youth Centre Information Evening. We have these evenings twice a year so that we can let you know about the variety of activities that we offer for your child. We know that it's important for you that your child has the opportunity for lots of fun while still remaining in a safe and supervised environment. Let me give you a little general information first. The Youth Centre has been on this site since the early 1960s. It was first established to help poorer families give their children some options in the evening. Nowadays, the goal is to provide young people a safe place to come and mix with friends of their own age without being driven to meet up on street corners, parks or malls, where they may create nuisances of themselves. The Youth Centre is staffed by adult volunteers, many of whom are parents whose children come here or used to come here. Because of this, a real community spirit is created based on friendship and mutual respect. 
The youth centre is open every evening to under-18s from 5pm to 10pm, though after 8pm the child has to be past his or her 14th birthday. There are always at least two adult staff members on duty. All the staff who work here, and any adult who has any business to be on the premises, have been subject to an enhanced police records check. To enter the youth centre, the child must pay a 50 cents entry fee unless he or she has become a member. Membership costs are $6 for six months or $10 for one year. This cheap price has been subsidised by the local council. The usual activities that we offer are table tennis, darts, snooker, cards, board games, badminton and bowling. There is also a modern music system so that the children who are interested in music can mix music and act as DJ for an hour. Outside, if the weather is okay, the children can play football or basketball. The outside area is surrounded by a high chain-link fence and no unauthorised person can enter. There is no extra cost for any of these activities. After finishing any of the activities, the children must clear up after themselves, which includes cleaning all the floors if necessary. You can see that we insist on self-discipline and responsibility, as well as having lots of fun. Naturally, some of the activities that we offer are more popular than others. We run a first-come, first-served basis for all of our facilities, but there is a rule that if someone is using an activity for up to an hour, and there are people wanting to use it, then the user must allow others to take over. As well as sports facilities, we have a small cafe that sells soft drinks, hot drinks and snacks. All these are priced very reasonably and all profits go back into the youth centre. There are boys and girls toilets and changing areas as well. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the introductory talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Once a week on Wednesdays, the local theatre group comes in and runs a theatre workshop. There is no extra cost for this and the workshop runs from 7 o'clock until 8.30. Every now and then we put on a show and the main hall of the youth centre can serve very well as a makeshift theatre. Another one of our regular evenings is our film evening. This takes place every second Tuesday evening. We have a big screen that gets put up in the main hall and we have a variety of age-appropriate films for the children. We do not offer new films as this would be too expensive, but the local video store, New Video, provides us with films free of charge for these evenings in return for some modest advertising. This allows us to offer another free of charge activity for our young people. Twice a month, on the second and fourth Saturday, we have a disco evening. This runs from 7pm until half past 10. There's an extra charge for everyone who wants to attend these evenings, but it's only 50 cents. The music for these evenings is organised and DJed by the children themselves. There are always two adults on duty during these evenings, but the children organise most of the fun. At the end of the evenings, the children clear up after themselves. If any child misbehaves in the youth centre, then he or she will be warned and we will give you a call to explain the problem. If a child gets three warnings, then the child will not be permitted to return to the youth centre for a period of one month. If any further warnings are necessary, then further action will be taken. We've never had to do this before, as the children are nearly always responsible, within the parameters of normal teenage behaviour, of course. So that's our youth centre. We have some leaflets by the door that you are welcome to take. There is a summary of what we have talked about this evening and a list of contact details, including our website. There are also some of the most important terms and conditions of using the youth centre and information about our insurance and liabilities. If you're interested in further information regarding any of these things, then full details are given on our website. Thank you very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 3. You will hear a student asking a member of staff questions at a university open day. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning. I'm looking for the information office for Westley University's Business and Management Department. Is this it? Yes, this is it. I'm Dr. Smith and I'm on duty here to give information to prospective students for today's open day. Oh good. I've got a few questions for you. I'll take a seat and fire away. Well, the first thing is that it seems from your prospectus here that you offer more than one course connected to business and management. That's right. We have the standard business studies BA course, which is a sandwich course. Then we have BA courses in advertising, marketing, personnel management, finance and accountancy. These are all three-year courses, not sandwich ones. A sandwich course means that you have an extra year spent working in a placement in the workplace. We also offer postgraduate courses. There are master's degree courses in advertising, marketing, personnel management, finance and accountancy, and a general MBA. Master's degree courses can be studied full-time in one year or part-time over two years. The BA courses are all full-time. I'm interested in the standard business studies BA course. Can you let me know a little about the details of the course? Certainly. Over the first two years, you study obligatory modules such as economics, research methods, marketing, advertising, operations management, statistics, accountancy, personnel and finance. As I said earlier, the third year is spent working in industry. By the time you come back for the fourth year, we hope that you have more of an idea of what you wish to do as a job after graduation. So we provide a wide range of different modules. You get to select five of these year four electives, as we call them. Some are specialised courses aimed at a particular field of business and some merely extend your knowledge into courses studied in the first two years. As research methods are needed really for the dissertation work in year three, that's not an elective. And how will I be assessed over the course? In the first two years and the last year. Some will be at the end of the first semester, which is in February, and the remainder at the end of the second semester, which is in July. The exams are all between two and three hours in length. Naturally, there are essays and assignments that will be set by your subject lecturers and tutors during the semesters. And each module's grade is based on 50% from coursework and 50% from the exam. You need to pass everything to stay on the course, though we allow you to retake exams over the summer if you've had failures. By the end of the first two years, though, you need to have a passing grade in all modules in order to continue. We only allow students to retake a whole year in exceptional circumstances. The fourth year is the same as years one and two. You will have exams at the end of the first and second semester on the electives that you choose. Are there any exams during the work experience year? No, but in that year you will need to write a dissertation. The dissertation is usually a research paper on some aspect of the business that you're working in during the work experience year. It has to be between 14 and 15,000 words in length. Towards the end of year two, you will liaise with the supervisor with regard to your question and you will stay in contact with him or her over the year. The dissertation needs to be submitted to the university on the first day of the fourth year, and you will not be admitted onto the fourth year of the course unless the dissertation is given in. What happens if I'm sick or something? Of course, there are rules and regulations covering most eventualities, and you'll be given a copy of those when you begin your dissertation. There's also an appeal process for all work marked by the university, with the final appeal being decided on by a panel including staff and students, so we believe you get a fair opportunity with everything. That does sound fair enough. What does the average working week look like? You'll have two lectures a week for each module that you take in the first two years. In addition, there will also be two seminars and one tutorial. The seminars are also two hours in length, and the tutorial is one hour. The lectures involve everyone on your course, the seminars are in groups of around 15, and the tutorials usually involve only five students. The working day begins at 8 in the morning, and it can go on until 7 in the evening. It can be a long day then. 
Oh yes, it's a demanding course in many ways, but we really feel that when students leave with their degrees, they really have a solid knowledge of business practices and that they are fully prepared to succeed in their chosen field. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. I've heard that there is a lot of mathematics needed, is that right? Yes, you really need to have a reasonable grasp of maths because so many modules, such as economics and finance, involve some advanced math skills. We realise that this can cause problems for some students, so we provide free emergency remedial maths courses after usual class hours in the first year in order to help students get their math skills up to scratch. Oh good, I might need to take advantage of those. Now, what other support is given to students with their studies? There's the Students' Union to start with. The Union can provide you with help and advice on all aspects of student life, including housing, finance, legal issues, sports, safety, health and even diet. They also organise lots of social events such as weekday and weekend parties, trips, societies and the summer ball. It costs £10 a year to join. You don't have to join, but nearly all students do as it offers so much. You cannot participate in any student societies or sports without being a member. £10 isn't so much for all that. Exactly. You'll also need to get a university ID card from the Student Services Building to go to the library. Again, there is a small charge for this ID card for the four years, £3. But it lasts for the duration of your course and it gives you access to all the books, periodicals and databases that the university has. It also grants you access to the computer centre and computer labs around the campus. If you don't have the card, you'll need to pay to use a computer each time that you use one on the university campus. Are the computers easily available? They usually are, as many students nowadays have their own. However, towards exam times and deadlines, computers can get used a lot, The students will work more on the campus. You can book computers in advance, though, online or at the centre. So if you're organised, there usually isn't a problem. Will someone show me how to do everything? Oh, yes. During the orientation week at the start of the first year, there are introductory talks and tours of the library, computer centre, students' union and sports centre. You'll be given unlimited information at the start, too much to process at the start, really. It all falls into place fairly soon, though. You mentioned the sports centre. What does that offer? The usual stuff. There's a large fitness studio with weights and cardiovascular machines. There are also lots of classes in the studio, such as yoga, circuit training, pilates, as well as others. There are two large sports halls for indoor football and cricket and other sports. There are four squash courts and ten outside tennis courts. That's not everything, but if you go down there, they'll give you a more comprehensive information sheet. You need to pay to join, but it's only £50 a year, so it's not very expensive. You'll need to be a member of the Students' Union, though, as the Students' Union membership gives you insurance for using the sports facilities. Finally, I'm around for a few days, and I was wondering if I could sit in on a lecture to get a feel for things. That shouldn't be a problem. Let's look at the schedule for tomorrow. Here we are. There's a Year 1 Accountancy Lecture at 10am, a Year 2 Economics Lecture at 2pm, and a Year 4 Operations Management Lecture at 3pm. Which one would you like? I'm really interested in Operations Management, but I have a meeting with the bank regarding a loan tomorrow at half past one, and I don't know whether I'll be back in time. I'd better go to the first one at 10. That's fine. I'm lecturing that one, so just turn up. The lecture hall is in Building 2, Floor 3, Room 14. Let me just make a note of that. Building 3, second floor and room 14? No, you've got the room number right, but it's building 2, third floor. OK, I've got that. Well, thank you very much, Dr Smith. You've certainly been very informative. You're welcome. I'll see you at the lecture tomorrow. Yes, goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part four. You will hear part of an environmental science lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning and welcome to this environmental sciences lecture. Today we will be discussing solar flares. It has been said that the cycles of solar flares affect the weather of the planet, the moods of its people, and even business cycles. When the sun was young, it was far more violent and active than it is today. It had a much faster rate of rotation. Its magnetic fields were stronger and less stable, and it produced even more powerful flares than those it produces today. But it was only seventy percent as bright as it is now. The sun became a mature star when it was about five to ten solar years old, or one to two billion Earth years. Scientists believe that the sun will shine as it does today for billions of years. But in about seven billion years, it will expand to one hundred times its current size and become what is known as a red giant. Its color will be deep red, and its luminosity will be about five hundred times greater than at present. After about two hundred and fifty million years in the red giant phase, scientists expect that the sun will go through a helium flash, which means it will explode and eject about one third of its mass into space. Thereafter, our sun's evolution is uncertain. It will probably go through a period of degeneration. When it is about fifteen billion years old, or seventy-five solar years, it will probably become a white dwarf star with a diameter similar to the one of the Earth's. It could finally become a black dwarf, which is essentially a small, cold, burnt-out shell. But we have a long way to go before the sun becomes a red giant or a white or black dwarf. Right now, the sun is in a long, quiet, relatively stable phase. So, how do solar flares affect us on Earth? Solar flares are huge gaseous outbursts from the sun. An average size flare may be more than six thousand miles long. A flare can release the energy equivalent of one hundred billion one megaton bombs. At the solar maximum, there may be as many as three to four small flares per hour, and one enormous flare each month. But during the minimum, weeks or months may pass without a flare of any significance. Solar flares strengthen the intensity of the solar wind, which is a steady stream of ionized helium and hydrogen particles radiating outward from the sun at around four hundred and fifty miles per second under great pressure. Carrying about one million tons of gas per second, the solar wind, which reaches the Earth in about four and a half days, impacts the magnetosphere, a magnetic field surrounding the Earth, causing such phenomena as the aurora borealis and geomagnetic storms. The solar wind can generate radio waves on Earth with a very long wavelength, known as extremely low frequency waves. The radiation generated by solar flares has a number of effects. The most clearly discerned of which is the disruption of radio communications, but some scientists also claim that everything from climatic changes to wars, earthquakes, and flu epidemics are associated with increased solar activity. Other scientists dispute these claims, and sunspots and solar flares are certainly not the only cause of such disturbances. However, there is a correlation between solar activity and certain kinds of social, behavioral, and geophysical effects. Let us examine the kinds of events that correlate with solar flares, starting with those that occur within days or weeks of intense solar activity: riots, battles, arson attacks, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions have been charted within days or weeks of intense solar activity. For example, in 1980, solar flares in May coincided with riots in Miami and South Korea, and the eruption of Mount St. Helens in May and June. 
Solar flares also preceded the April 1982 conflict between Great Britain and Argentina over the Falkland Islands and the US attack on Tripoli, Libya on April 14, 1986. By tracking solar flares, biologist Marsha Adams was able to assist the San Francisco Fire Department by predicting arson attacks 72 hours in advance. She believes that flares affect people within the first few days after they happen. Let's look at a specific example. Recently, a slightly less powerful flare erupted while aimed almost directly at the Earth. Eight minutes later, traveling at the speed of light, a wave of ultraviolet radiation seared the Earth's upper atmosphere. Low orbiting satellites encountering that fringe and running into increased drag slowed and dropped into lower orbits. A secret defense department satellite began a premature and fatal tumble, and the tracking system that keeps exact tabs on some 19,000 objects in Earth orbit briefly lost track of 11,000 of them. SolarMax, which is a NASA satellite designed to study flares and other solar activity, descended by as much as half a mile in a single day, almost certainly hastening its demise. On the Earth, the flares effects were equally disruptive. Shortwave transmissions were interrupted, some for as long as 24 hours, and satellite communication and a Coast Guard Loran navigation system were temporarily overwhelmed. Powerful transient magnetic fields generated in the upper atmosphere by the flare induced problems in transmission lines and wiring, and mystified homeowners reported automatic garage doors opening and closing on their own. Power surges in transmission lines and transformers in Quebec knocked out power throughout the entire province. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.